Welcome to Obamacare, a healthcare briefing. I'm WWJ News Radio 950's health reporter Sean Lee, here today with three area healthcare experts with a healthcare briefing information on the most sweeping changes to healthcare in our lifetime. Today, an update on the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare. I'm joined by Chris Johnston, Vice President of New Business and Consumer Solutions at Health Alliance Plan, Shannon Saksuski, Health Education Program Manager at the Detroit Regional Chamber, and Randy Hoover of Hoover and Associates. The four of us will do our best to demystify Obamacare, provi providing you information that we hope will help with your personal health insurance plans and provide information for employers facing health plan decisions. We're here today in the studio of Civic Center TV in West Bloomfield. Today's program is presented by the Greater West Bloomfield Chamber of Commerce, the Detroit Regional Chamber in cooperation with Health Alliance Plan and Hoover and & Associates and produced by Civic Center TV, a service of the Greater West Bloomfield Cable Communications Commission. Okay, so Chris, we'll start with you. Why healthcare reform and why now? Well, one reason is if you look at the gross domestic product of our country today and the economic impact, the cost of care is, is rising and it's truly unsustainable right now for consumers and businesses. If you look at the health care share of the GDP, uh, in 2012 it was 17.9 percent. They're projecting for 2022 that it's going to climb up to 19.9 percent. Um, this rate of increase has slowed. Uh, for a number of reasons, and it's possible as a result of the ACA, um, but it's too early to tell. But that's one big reason is the econ economic impact. Makes sense. Okay, Shannon, I'll pose that question to you. Why health care reform and why now? Sure, in part, uh, for many reasons, but uh, in part health care access. There are around 1.2 million uninsured people in Michigan alone out of a population of just over 9 million. And um, the Affordable Care Act is meant to increase access and affordability for those folks. And then, Randy, finally, with you, why health care reform and why now? What's your take on that? Well, I think there was, um, our system wasn't perfect. It had um, uh, a math problem, really. It's, um, the, uh, it was unaffordable premiums. Uh, we had noticed this about a decade ago. In our business, we had hired a consultant to try to steer us to some other areas where it might be more fruitful. But we were concerned about the unsustainability of the rate increases. So just to frame this for people, if by the rule of 72, if you have a 12% rate increase, your price doubles every six years. So we thought it was, we were seeing single rates over six years ago, nearly 900. So if that was 1800, how could someone even pay for half? It's almost like a house or car payment, rent payment. It's, it was a substantial, um, and um, we believed, um, unstable environment. So I think the, uh, the, the time was ripe for health care reform and uh, the president, you know, H Hillary tried a while back and then uh, President Obama uh, was successful in uh, producing some health care reform and uh, we'll see how it plays out. We will. Okay. What are some of the issues in health care reform, some of the most important ones today, Shannon? Sure. So I mentioned the 1.2 million uninsured people. Many people are going to be using the marketplace, the health insurance marketplace, to find coverage. And so finding the marketplace, understanding the marketplace, and understanding how to use it and navigate it to um, maximize its potential for everyone's individual um, household is really important. So. Um, that's problematic in that most consumers are getting their information about the marketplace from the media, which people also perceive, and maybe it's true, that uh, the media is often politicized. So where do people go to find information? Getting the word out about that is really important. Um, and so people have to understand where to turn for help. But I'd say three of the t top three things to know about healthcare reform right now, especially for individual consumers, is where to find individual um, financial help, how to uh, make, how to enroll, which means navigating the marketplace, but it also means knowing how to make the first payment on one's plan. Until the first payment is made, the person is not enrolled and understanding where to find an agent or broker for in-person help if they need it. Very good. Okay. So, Randy, I'm going to pose that question to you. What do you see as some of the most important issues in health care reform right well, now? Well, I would agree with Shannon. There's been so much um, 
well, for one thing, it's a 2,600-page law. So if you stacked up a copy paper ream of 250 pages, that's 10. So it's like, it's it's, it's like a almost a encyclopedia of books. So it's large, uh, complicated. Uh, it's been uh, there's been um, um, the the politicized messages of um, good or bad uh, uh, on the uh, media have I think kind of scared a lot of American consumers. Some people who are actually um, I've even met like just even my family members have just been I, why haven't you signed up yet? They're like well you know they think they can wait and they think there's problems with the website. So I think there's some the, the messages haven't been fruitful for uh, the media hasn't done anyone any favors with how some of this thing has uh, been reported. Um, also, the, um, the the law keeps changing, and that's been a mixed message, I think, for people too. It's kind of encouraging people to wait. So, and Chris, what do you see as some of the most important issues in healthcare reform right now? Well, it's interesting. Randy mentioned how how thick this law is, and it, it keeps growing because it hasn't been finished yet. They're still writing the laws as we go along today. Um, and one of the biggest issues for businesses in particular out there are the, the employer shared responsibility delays uh, that are for the mid-size and large companies out there. So it was really just uh, four weeks ago that the IRS and the Treasury Department actually uh, shared with us a lot of these provisions that are going to be coming out it, for the employer uh, shared responsibility. Some of these provisions were how do you comply as a small and mi as a mid-size and a large business uh, to a lot of these provisions. Um, one of those things that came out of it was for um, uh, emergency responders, firefighters. They wanted to make sure that they were counted as um, a part-time employee, not a full-time employee. Um, they wanted to let the, um, the small and the medium-sized businesses know how to comply with this employer share responsibility and the provisions of how this is coming out. So, you know, as I mentioned, they're, they're just writing these laws as we go right now. So there's a lot of confusion in the marketplace about the employer share responsibility. Understood. Okay, so recently we heard some talk of the administration extending that keep your plan fix that we heard about a couple months ago. So uh, for individuals who were in non-compliant plans, they were going to be allowed to stay in those plans a little bit longer. Chris, can you help clarify what we've heard just the most uh, recently on, on this issue? Well, I'll try. So <laughs> just a couple days ago, uh, it, it came across the news wire, and it, it's a rumor so far uh, that the Obama administration is going to announce an extension of the plan cancellation transition. Um, essentially, what he's saying is we're going to allow consumers, and we're not sure about businesses yet, uh, being able to keep their non-ACI, non-ACA compliant plans um, for uh, an undefined period of time. So uh, at this time, it's, it's, it's kind of speculation to, to go any further on the details of this. We're hoping for more clarification from the government um, probably in the next couple of days. But we know at this point with those non-compliant plans based on um, what Health and Human Services Secretary Sebelius told us a couple of months ago and the president himself, those consumers can stay in those plans until the end of 2014. Is that right? Yeah, so the law said that in, in January of 2014, you must be in a, uh, a compliant ACA plan upon renewal. Um, so that's where a lot of the confusion came in. Um, the law, as it was written in 2010, said that as of January 2014, you, your old plan will not, um, you will not be able to be in that plan. You must have a new ACA compliant plan. So a lot of these delays just keep kind of piling up on each other. Um, and this is the, the next one if it does come to fruition. Um, for businesses uh, and possibly consumers as well, um, that they'll be able to keep this non-ACA compliant plan for indefinite, or not indefinite, but a, a certain defined period of time. And Randy, can you speak to any of that confusion with the keep your plan versus what you're hearing from businesses and employees? Right, it's, it's a difficult, <clears throat> it's, I can't imagine a more difficult situation to be running a business that has a large variable with the uh, uh, health care. Uh, let me give you an example. Um, there may be uh, 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 re restaurants are certainly impacted where they've had a lot of people that are working part-time, which would be roped into get, having to give these people uh, benefits, uh, hotels, etc. So we've had customers that have spent thousands and thousands of dollars, tons of um, they've put off everything in their company sometimes, the top management, just to figure out the healthcare thing because it's such a large number. It can, 
you know, it, it's, it's a cost they've never had to experience before. It, it can double their employee benefit costs in one year, which were already substantial. So um, it's to have these things, you know, changing so rapidly, I can't imagine how frustrating it would be. I mean, we're, our company has tried to steer, help steer corporations in this area, and I, we've been in these meetings. It's just, I, I don't know, um, I, hopefully it'll stop you know, because it's got to be a, a juggernaut for these companies to deal with. Understood. Okay, so let's talk some of the trends we're seeing in the health benefits world. Chris, do you want to start with that one? Sure. Uh, well, one big trend right now is uh, it's what's called defined contribution. Um, some people call this the new frontier in health benefits. Um, what it really does is it allows employers to give their employees different options. So what people are used to today when they go to work for a business is a defined benefit. So you go to work for a company and they offer you one, maybe two, maybe three plans, and it's a defined benefit. That's, this is what the plan is, hopefully it'll work for you and your family. A defined contribution is a little different. Uh, what it does here is it gives each of the employees a defined amount of money for the year, and then it gives the employees more options, for example, 10 options. So it really helps to get the, um, the employer out of the administration of some of these plans. Um, they're hoping to give their employees more options so wherever you happen to be in your station in life, instead of one or two or three plans, you have an option of 10 plans to pick from. Um, and a lot of the employers are looking at this as a, a better option, a more flexible option than going to, for example, the government shop uh, website and getting a plan that way. Okay, very good. So Chris, let's talk more about the recent extension for mid-sized businesses. What do business owners most need to know with regard to this? Sure. Well, there's really three uh, buckets of uh, uh, businesses, if you will, out there. Um, there's small businesses that are that have between one and 50 employees, and that makes up about 96 percent of all the employers that are out there in the country. Um, these folks are not required to offer health and cover health coverage to their employees at all. So. Um, that's the, the first bucket, if you will. The second one is the medium-sized um, employers, and they are sized 50 to 99, and this is approximately 2% of the employers that are out there in the country today. Um, for these folks, they do have to offer coverage, um, but some of the delays that were out there um, allows them an extra year of, of the insured, um, employer shared responsibility plan. So for 2015, these, these companies in the medium size will be keeping track of how many employee, employees they have, if they're full-time or part-time, what type of plans that they're offering. But it's not until 2016 that they're going to be responsible um, for the employer shared responsibility part of the plan. The third bucket, if you will, is the larger employers. This is 100 plus, um, and this is about 2% of the employers that are out there. A majority of all these companies that are out there offer benefits to their employees right now. So what's happening with the delays for them is that is what percentage of your employees do you have to cover? And for 2015, it's 70%, and then for 2016, it goes up to 95% um, of their full-time employees that they have to cover. And if they don't, then they have the employer share responsibility, and that is that they have to pay $2,000 um, for every employee that's out of compliance, sure, and you eliminate the first 30 on there. Um, so for each one of these, there's different ramifications. And there's the delays that are part of this is what each one of these have to have to consider going forward for 14, 15, and 16. Lots of growing pains <laughs> associated yeah. with this. And it gets complicated. It really does. Absolutely. So, Randy, how are you seeing this particular piece of the legislation play out with your clients? Well, again, uh, we have some people or, or some corporations that are right in the eye of the storm, so to speak. So they technically have gotten a holiday from this uh, mandate. So uh, some are going to be um, uh, joyful and they don't have to deal with it for another year. But I will say that uh, it's been very complex for planning. Again, we had one employer who was uh, contemplating uh, letting go some of their locations to fit under the 50 uh, person uh, mandate. So they did not want to be subject to the, um, it wasn't in their business model to supply the health care. It hasn't been for decades, so it wasn't going to work. So, but um, I was just mentioning last night, I'm like, well, how, would that, how would that feel? You're planning a sale of your business, but now you don't have to for another year. It's, that's got to be tough, you know, um, to sell one of your divisions or not. You know, it's, it's, I don't know how you plan around that. Yeah. It's just 
Un it's just fascinating. So I will, will say this. With the, I, I've done some meetings recently where we've rolled out the new plans, the new compliant plans that are that were necessary on your first renewal in 14. So here we've done some. And um, the new plans are you know, compliant with the government specifications, but sadly they sometimes have higher out-of-pocket costs for employees. And that can be another 500 or 1,000 per family on deductibles, and they're not less expensive. And the people are, you know, it's, it's just, I, I said to one meeting, I wish the president was here to see this with Vice President Biden. These are real people who probably voted for them that are going to have to pay more for less, and they don't understand it. And it, it would just, I'm the person that takes the brunt, though. So we're, we're delivering this in a meeting, and, and uh, we do what we can. But so, again, plans are more complex. Um, and uh, the other thing that is uh, interesting, Michigan had group reform a number of years ago, and rates for singles were one rate. Rates for a couple were one rate, and rate for a family was one rate. Now, some of these employers are forced with rates that differentiate on each person based on their age, et cetera. It's fascinating. I don't know how the HR people are going to deal with all these random rates for people. And I think another unintended consequence is older workers are paying more for health insurance. That was sad. So it's, it's just hard. These are a lot of things that we're having to deal with in the field to uh, deliver the same health care. It, it just uh, there's a lot of variables right now. So. And, and those variables seem to just affect everyone. You're watching Obamacare, a healthcare briefing. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Obamacare, a healthcare briefing. I'm WWJ News Radio 950's health reporter, Sean Lee. I'm joined by local agent Randy Hoover. Chris Johnston from HAP, and Shannon Saksuski with the Detroit Regional Chamber's My Health Answers program. So, Chris, something you wanted to add about the small business piece with Obamacare. Yes, I just wanted to put one thing in perspective. So I had mentioned that for small businesses, one to 50. That's 96% of all the employers around the country. And I had mentioned that they're not obligated to offer health insurance to their employees. So a lot of people out there are thinking, wow, there's going to be a lot of employers that are going to be washing their hands of health coverage and no longer offering this to their employees. And one thing to keep in mind on this is, um, you know, for the last 50, 60 years, um, it's always been employer-based coverage for various reasons. And the reason that employers offer coverage is to stay competitive in the marketplace. So, you know, what we've seen at least so far is there's a lot of employers out there, they're not washing their hands of coverage. They realize the importance of keeping a competitive workforce uh, from down the street, perhaps taking their employees from them. And a lot of them are really gonna be obviously looking at the various options that are out there um, as we progress forward with this. But initially right now, they're not. They are keeping their coverage. And I, I think that's an important thing to note. And I don't know if Randy's seen that in the marketplace as well as an agent. Uh, I have. Um, as, as, as Chris points out, group health insurance actually started during World War II to attract workers during the wage and price controls. To, and um, that's where the genesis of the group health started, and it's still here. And I think it's a large, employers need to have people show up to do a good job for their customers every day. And to the extent you say, well, Math has changed. We're not, like, go to the exchange, and I don't, we don't see it happening. We've only had a couple groups, so to speak, degroup, and uh, it was because uh, of uh, the carriers taking a little bit different look at their group. It wasn't that they thought it was a better strategy to throw their people out in the marketplace for coverage. I think it's imperative that uh, you know the business of America is business. They have to people show up to do good things, and I think it's you're, you're taking a big chance by canceling your benefit plan and hoping your employees show up. I don't, I don't think it's a good strategy. Yet. We've only had two groups to group, so to speak, and uh, it wasn't due to um, it was more uh, carrier-based constraints. So we're just not seeing some of those predictions come to no. pass. I haven't seen it. No. Okay. So lots of complications for businesses. And yet, despite that, the individual mandate still stands, Shannon. So can you explain some of the individual mandate points for us and give us some of the reasons why you think it might not be delayed? Sure, sure. So the individual mandate, basically uh, similar to the employer mandate, means that uh, individuals must be covered with uh, adequate coverage. Um, 
or pay a fine. So the the enrollment date for 2014 is set at March 31st. Next year, um, 2015, it'll be it'll be different, but. Um, the fines are for 2014 relatively neg negligible so it's either it's the greater of 1% for this year um, or $95 whichever is greater and there there's there's some detail behind that but the maximum a household will pay is $285 for 2014 if they choose not to have coverage and there are um, groups of people who are exempt from the fine as well if you earn an income below as an individual an income below $10,000 for example, you're exempt from that fine. Um, for 2015, it, it scales up over the next several years. For 2015, it's either 2% of one's income or the household income or $325. And 2016, it's 2.5% of household income or $695. So it, it, it scales up and it becomes um, uh, differently painful financially uh, over the next several years. Um, and so I, I, you asked, why do I not think that's going to be delayed? Well, probably because it's already started. We're, at, uh, we're in the middle of it right now. And already, as of the end of February, around 4 million people have already enrolled. And the, that's, that's nationwide. And around 7 million people, that was, that was the projected goal. So we're on course to meet that goal right now. OK, very good. Chris, let's get back now to some of the opportunities and challenges that businesses are facing in light of this new law. Sure, there are a number of them, and Randy had touched on one of these. And the first one is really the new taxes and fees that are out there for all the businesses. Um, so we have to fund this somehow. Um, so really, they're doing this through a lot of taxes and fees. The first one is the health insurance premium <coughs> tax um, that's out there. There's risk adjustment fees that are out there, uh, as well as exchange or user fees for those who actually go out to the exchange. There's, there's a fee for doing this, and that's how, we're, how they're helping to fund this uh, new math, if you will, that's out there. Um, for employers, there's the 90-day maximum waiting period. So when you're an employee and you now become eligible uh, for your employer plan, you can't uh, wait more than 90 days before your coverage begins. So that's something new for a lot of new employers that are out there. Um, the way that you create uh, the rating structure for employers, Randy had alluded before uh, that there was a single rate and a double rate and a uh, family rate. And that structure has changed in how you can rate on the structure has changed. So really there's only four factors that you can rate on right now. There's the age band um, where you reside. Um, so where an employer is based, it used to be just on where all the employees are based, but now it's just where the employer is based. Um, and that zip code where they are. Um, tobacco, if that's being used. Um, and then the different rating methodology rating, uh, Randy had alluded to was the single double family is now changing to a PMPM, which is called per member per month. Um, so that can change for every single individual within an organization. Um, so those are some of the challenges for employers. Communicating all these ch uh, changes to the employees is always a challenge. Things are changing. Um, then there's also determining as an employer, am I grandfathered or am I not grandfathered? And, and that has a lot of companies confused as well uh, for changing their plans. So there's a, just some of the challenges for employers that are out there these days. I have to say I'm so glad I'm not a business owner right now because that is well, it seems so complicated. Well, you need an expert, and, and that's where you know an independent agent like Randy can really help you walk through the, a lot of these complexities that are out there. Okay, so let's delve a little deeper into that, Randy. Subsidies, tax credits for businesses and individuals, they've got to go out onto the marketplace and get those. How, how's that working? Well, the marketplace has obviously got off to a highly publicized, unfortunate start, but I think uh, there's been a lot of massive improvement since then. So I think people need to forget about the first media reports they heard. So that's that's the good news. If I may circle back on tax that, that, that Chris was alluding to, just to put some uh, you know, uh, figures to, to this. We have a company locally here, about 60 employees. They're paying about $800 a month in new federal tax on their premium. And uh, so that's a lot of money. It's 10000 a year just about for that group. So it was the first billing. Believe me, our office had tons of calls. Wow, what is this? This is in December for their January bill, a surprise present. Even if their group hadn't migrated to the new ACA compliant plans, the tax was due. So anyway, that was, uh, and there already is a state tax to help fund, I believe, Medicaid in our state. So two line items, 
both aren't positive. So back to your question on the health insurance exchanges. So they started off somewhat slowly, but uh, and people were um, it took multi-hour periods to um, and use the exchanges as a consumer. Also, um, we would we we help and coach people through this process. So we'll tell them what to do, what information they need, and during the and this is just some anecdotal stories. So people have been on enrolling, getting the subsidy on, on the plans, and it's working pretty well. Um, they have to be, just be patient. That's the watchword. Um, expect to have, perhaps it frees up. You can call the government. They'll, they'll uh, unlock it, so to speak, and can keep progressing forward. But uh, people have been very thrilled about the, uh, what's happening. Uh, we've seen uh, substantial subsidies for people. They're, um, they may start out with a, perhaps a $600 single rate they're working with, but it might be, if they're lower income, perhaps 16, 17,000, it might be cut down by as much as uh, two thirds. And uh, then also there's cost sharing reduction. So therefore, if the deductible might have started out at $1,400 on a silver plan, it may end up only 300 at the end of the day. So those are available through the subsidy. And so people need to, even if they don't prefer to use the government website at the start, it's, it's really the best route to get the subsidies and cost sharing. So I guess patience is mandatory. Do your homework before you get on the site. And um, if you can find someone, our office, et cetera, other people can help you through, shepherd you through that process. But it works and uh, they're open and we've only got a month left. So I, mm -hmm. I just would, um, the urban legends, um, it, it does, it, everything's working fine. So it, it just, don't expect it to be, you know, like ordering a pizza. It's, it's, it's not two minutes. It's, it's going to take a few hours. But, you know, it, it's a large financial decision for a family. So perhaps that's okay. So. Yeah, and there's been a lot of talk about the fact that uh, a lot of people that are going to be going on the marketplace maybe don't have the expertise to figure these things out on them on their own. And I have to say, as someone covering this for the last several months, it does seem like a lot of community groups are stepping up to provide help through certified application counselors and navigators. So people can get help if they avail themselves of it. So Shannon, what are some of the most common questions you're getting with regard to this? Sure, so My Health Answers, um, my program receives the questions, any questions from anyone in the entire state about healthcare reform. So that's businesses, that's individuals um, at any income level. And we are receiving questions from all of the groups. The individuals want to know how to navigate the marketplace. So uh, they are sometimes looking for those certified application counselors Oftentimes, they uh, benefit from working directly, often face to face with an agent like Randy. Um, and so, uh, helping people understand income levels and what a plan is, what all of the, uh, some people are new to insurance, so understanding the lingo that's involved, that's a lot of, of what's involved working with individuals. Working with businesses, um, there was a mention that we aren't, we have not seen businesses drop coverage, and that is absolutely true. I wonder what that's going to look like in the future. Whether this is sort of um, an orientation year to help people understand what the options are, what these marketplaces, including the shop marketplace, what what function do they serve really, and what are the costs involved? So we've been getting, especially from very small employers, questions about: Is it better for me me as an employer, not just me as an, an employer, rather, but for my employees, is it better to uh, to offer coverage, or would it be financially beneficial to have my employees, based on their income levels and life circumstances, would it be better to have them go to the individual marketplace and drop coverage as an employer? Um, businesses, especially the smaller businesses, uh, are still wondering, how do I count FTEs? Um, FTE is full-time equivalent, not full-time employee. And so understanding in what category businesses fit in the small, mid, large size business, that's really important. And the math and the, the, um, the information, the complexity involved there is, is uh, sometimes off-putting and confusing. And we try to help businesses through that. We're getting questions about that as well. Understood, okay. So one question I want to pose to any or all of you, repeatedly we've heard throughout this process, <coughs> if the young invincibles, that so-called group of young healthy people, don't buy into the marketplace, 
we're not gonna be able to balance out the older, sicker people. In any of your experiences, are you seeing the young Invincibles sign up and say, yes, I'll take the coverage, I won't be taking the penalty? And I'd say, yes, we are starting to see some of them. Mm -hmm. um, we're just not seeing the volume. And, and, and the premise behind that is prior to the ACA coming out, there used to be, and not getting into details, but it used to be a rating band of seven to one for the rates. Um, so essentially it allowed the really young to get better rates and as you progressed in, in age, uh, your rates kind of progressed higher as well as a kind of seven to one band. Now it's only a three to one band. And essentially what that means is, you know, the rates for the older people are coming down but for the younger folks, the young in Invincibles, they're going up to kind of help subsidize this. So it's a, a three to one rating band. And um, that's the premise on how this will all survive. Um, so we do need the young Invincibles uh, to sign up. Um, they are signing up, but just not really in the volume yet that, we've, that, that we need. And I wonder in part whether or not that's um, due to some procrastination. Uh, just a question. Uh, maybe, maybe there will be a smaller number of young invincibles who will sign up, but maybe people are waiting and they're not quite sure when the due date is and, and those mm -hmm. sorts of issues. Right. So I wonder whether or not we're going to see a surge. Uh, we've been working, um, My Health Answers has been, has been working a fair bit with colleges and universities to help um, help not just students, but their families understand what health care reform is and what it could mean for them. So I know from those experiences that there's a fair bit of confusion about what, what in the world this means for a student who's still in school, who has um, maybe a very low income, who has complicated life circumstances because they're in transition uh, from, from being at home to being an adult um, in some cases. So, um, But that, that provision of the the law that lets mm -hmm. students stay on their parents' mm -hmm. um, plan a little bit longer yes. is helpful. It's helpful, it's very helpful, and a lot of families are choosing that route, choosing to use that provision. Again, there are several, uh, well, there are more than a million people in the state that are uninsured, and so some young invincibles fall into that naturally. Um, but some decisions have to be made in the family whether or not the parent will claim the, that student, whether or not, I don't want to use this word child, but that young person on their taxes because it's the tax household uh, that is the basis for subsidies. And so if the student was on their own in their own tax household and the parent did not claim them on their taxes, then they could very well uh, qualify for subsidies or potentially even Medicaid. Understood. Randy, any thoughts on the Young Invincibles? We saw some signing up, but you know who did? The people who were steered by their parents. Yeah. You know, that's, yeah. I'm just, these are, again, I'm, my, I'm not, uh, I don't know all, but I just saying our experience was the, um, there were people, you know, young, n just north of 26, or those who weren't eligible for employer-sponsored coverage or was substantially more money through the employer to add them on. The parents, you know, directed them to us. We wrote a bunch of them, but that was, and, and they, you know, we haven't, you know, it's happening. And I think, why is this important? Because um, we need to have them covered somehow. And the reason is, obviously, if they bought insurance, that would be nice because it would help subsidize the older. But also, uncompensated care is something we have to really be careful of in our country. So for every young person that is invincible, that doesn't get coverage, that doesn't even sign up for through the exchange for Medicaid, which is free. They could get Medicaid, and the college student that has no income, they don't need to buy insurance. Just go on and get Medicaid, fine. If they have an appendix burst, they have a skiing accident or something, they are not gonna be an indigent or you know uncompensated care to a hospital. That is gonna really damage our healthcare system, the uncompensated care. It's getting worse, and we need to, even if they go to Medicaid, I'd be fine. Just get something so that if there's a shock loss or a, again, these are not ordinary occurrences. Young people are generally healthy, but if they have a car accident or aren't insured well for some reason, that's a giant burden on our healthcare system. So I wanted to point out, you know, it's, it's not, you know, they can get Medicaid for free. Go to the exchange, it's fine. You know, if they have no income, it's self-evident. You know, if they work at a restaurant and don't have a lot of income, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Just some coverage is better than zero. Right, and I, I have to say, through the stories that I've done on this, the young invincibles that I've interviewed, 
Uh, most of them don't have that attitude of, oh, I'm healthy, I'm fine. <coughs> Many of them have said, you know, it's nice just to have that in your back pocket just in case something happens. I think a lot of them are savvy enough to recognize that, as you said, if I get in an accident, um, I, I get a concussion, whatever, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to be covered. Shannon, did you want to add something to that? We, uh, we, I, we've repeatedly referred to Medicaid, and I think that it should be said that, well, I, I neglected to mention that we've also, at My Health Answers, been receiving lots of questions about Healthy Michigan. Healthy Michigan is Michigan's Medicaid expansion plan, and it will be avail it is slated to be available at uh, the beginning of April. And um, people who earn an income of up to 133 percent of the federal poverty level that is uh, let me see here well with a five percent income disregard as uh, it's 138 percent of the federal poverty level a person a, a single person households we keep talking about students and mm -hmm. young invincibles so maybe they're they're single they're just one person that's um for for 2013 at least it's fifteen thousand eight hundred and fifty six dollars that's the threshold that's the maximum one can earn to qualify for healthy michigan the idea of Healthy Michigan is to make, uh, make health coverage because of those uncompensated costs much more available to cit citizens in the state, but in terms of the, the financial limitations, but also it, it, the idea is to make it easier to enroll. It's really complicated. There are a lot of factors that are considered when enrolling in um, Medicaid right now. Healthy Michigan, will, um, the idea is that it will change that. Okay, so lots of information out there, and we need to make sure that we help people get to the information yes. that they need. So, Shannon, let's start with you. If yes. people want to contact you directly, or are there resources mm -hmm. you'd like to share with us right yes, now? Yes, like I've, I've referred to My Health Answers. We can be found at mihealthanswers.com, and there one can sign up for our newsletter. It's bi-weekly. They can contact me. I am at advisor at mihealthanswers, mihealthanswers.com. Um, we have a web forum, so if you just want to shoot out a question, uh, you can just enter it on the website and uh, someone, probably me, um, will answer and uh, we're also on Twitter and Facebook. Thank you. Randy, I'll go to you next. Uh, how can people get in touch with you and are there any other resources you'd like to share? Yes, we have, um, in anticipation of such, you know, the, uh, the uh, Health Care Act, we've launched a new website for, for to focused on Michigan, so it's, it's um, uh, healthinsuranceformichigan.com and then also um, the uh, if for someone that has just north of uh, 65 we have uh, Medicare for Michigan so those are there's FAQs excellent um, I mean this program's been very valuable I'm sure but we can there are some other you know frequently answered questions if you don't want to yeah. ask uh, you know type them in you can probably look them up instantaneously and um, but we speak English, so you could just call us, and uh, we'll we'll talk at our office. So it's 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 okay to look at websites, but sometimes you need to ask questions and talk to real people, and yeah. that's 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 I guess our, our greatest value. Absolutely, very helpful. And Chris, how can people get more information and any resources you'd like to share? Well, probably the best way uh, to get a hold of HAP is uh, through our phone number, and it's an eight five five with HAP, um, and. We have people waiting to, to help consumers that are out there, and the, what we've noticed out there is there's definitely a pent-up demand out there. And each conversation, on average, is almost 45 minutes. I mean, that gives you an idea how many questions people right. are, are asking and how complex it is. So we do have people that can help you with those things. We also have a resource out there, and it's um, at choosehap.org. We have a number of tools out there um, to help you answer a lot of these questions that are out there. It's an awesome resource uh, that we launched this, this year. Um, so I should suge suggest people to go, to go out there to get some of these answers. Okay, very good. I'd like to thank all of you. That's very helpful. If you would like more information about Obamacare and how it impacts you and your employees, here are just some of the websites providing useful information. Again, I'd like to thank our guests, health insurance and financial professional and local agent, Randy Hoover of Hoover & Associates, 
Chris Johnston from Health Alliance Plan and Shannon Saksuski. She's with the Detroit Regional Chamber's My Health Answers program. Thanks also to the Detroit Regional Chamber, the Greater West Bloomfield Chamber of Commerce, Health Alliance Plan, Hoover and Associates, the production team here at Civic Center TV, and the Greater West Bloomfield Cable Communications Commission. For continuing information, visit these websites. I'm Sean Lee from WWJ News Radio 950. Thanks for watching.